TV. Uh, so the title of my uh, dissertation is Holistic Representations for Activities and uh, Crowd Behaviors. Uh, there is a vast amount of video data captured uh, either by the surveillance cameras or captured by the users and uploaded online uh, nowadays. So here we are interested in solving uh, problems in uh, different scenarios. The first problem uh, we are interested in uh, is that uh, like we would like to recognize the actions of uh, individuals. So it has different applications such as the classification of uh, user uploaded videos. Here, like we would like to automatically label these videos as tennis, swinging, and drumming, for example. And we can also do video retrieval. And uh, there is the assisted living application. In this one, we would like to recognize the actions of uh, elder people or children and also monitor the patients. And uh, nowadays, uh, as you know, there's the Xbox and the uh, video consoles, and they need some human computer interaction uh, on, in video games. Also, we're interested in another problem, which is recognizing the crowd behaviors automatically. So the, the possible applications may be the prediction of congestion, so avoid some crowd disasters, and uh, like identify the crowd behaviors and also abnormal behaviors. So the, these uh, uh, problems are challenging because there's a lot of variation in scene settings and recording, such as the frame rate and uh, resolution. And uh, the, inter like the, people, the appearance of people who are performing the actions may be different. Also, the way they uh, perform the action uh, may be different. And uh, for example, in crowd videos, we have hundreds of people in the scene or uh, vehicles in the scene. So the, the number of objects is, the pro is one of the problems. Uh, because it uh, results in severe occlusion. Uh, also, uh, sometimes we have uh, limited, um, uh, limited data available for training and learning all these behaviors. So, so first, uh, in, in the first piece of this dissertation, so we were focusing on, uh, uh, on a holistic scene and motion descriptor uh, for the uh, real videos. So this descriptor has some advantages, such as it, it preserves the spatial and temporal information in the videos, and it doesn't require interest point detection, uh, background subtraction, uh, or uh, tracking. And it has high performance on the public available data sets. And uh, in the second piece, we, uh, we tried to, imp we presented a new approach for improving the performance of holistic descriptors. Uh, in this case, uh, we are, rather than uniting all the blocks of a holistic descriptor blindly, we just uh, select an optimal set of blocks so that we, st we still uh, we, we can reduce the dimensionality of the feature vectors. Also, we can improve the performance. And uh, in the third piece, uh, which is a different uh, problem, uh, normally, you know, in the scenes, in these ones, there are only one or two people. Uh, but in crowd video videos, we have hundreds of people. Here, uh, we present a uh, method which is based on Lagrangian particle dynamics so that we are able to identify some specific crowd behaviors without the need of object detection, tracking, or training. And also, we have, some, uh, we have collected a data set for this. So here comes the first piece. Uh, which this is about the holistic descriptor. Here's the uh, problem. So we have uh, different action classes. Uh, and people, like in this one, for example, there are six action classes and uh, boxing, hand clapping, hand waving, and so on. This data set is the KTH data set, which is relatively uh, simple, and this is captured in a controlled environment. Also, there are videos captured by users and uploaded online on YouTube. So there are two data sets uh, we worked on for this purpose. One is UCA50, the other is AJMDB51. In this one, you can see the videos are, have uh, more variability, and. Uh, this diversity makes this uh, problem more challenging. So here we have 50 action classes and we have 51 action classes for HMBB51. You can see some samples here. The aim is to label each of them automatically. So there are some related work in uh, human action recognition. The popular approach is to uh, detect some local uh, spatial temporal interest points and compute descriptors around these points. And uh, the, uh, you may know there is the step dollar sift and 3D sift, which are some of the examples of these descriptors. These methods usually utilize the Bagel Features framework. So even though the descriptors are computed locally, they are combined in a global histogram. So they may lack the uh, important uh, geometrical or temporal information. 
Also, there are trajectory-based methods, such as uh, MBH and the work of Wu. Uh, in these ones, they uh, need to uh, they, uh, compute the trajectories in the foreground, so they neglect uh, in context information which is present in the background. But it may be helpful. For example, if you have the horse riding action, when you see the outdoor scene, the grass and so on, it may help uh, improving the performance of the classifier. The holistic descriptors have some advantages such that we don't need to ex uh, detect the interest points and they have a relatively simpler structure and they preserve the spatial and temporal relation. So why is this important? Like here's an example. This is a video like opening a window, opening window action. So if you don't know the temporal information, uh, so these two, the, the other is just the reverse of this video which is closing the window. It's just uh, reversed in time. So these, if the uh, me, uh, if your method does not cannot uh, you know uh, capture the temporal information, then it will think these two actions are the same, but they are different actions. So our goal is to classify a large number of realistic actions uh, using the global information. One way to capture global information can be by using a frequency spectrum. For example, for the images, if you look at the frequency spectrum, uh, you can capture the structure and organization in the in the scene, uh, looking at some. Uh, uh, some uh, frequency components. And uh, similarly for the video, uh, if you analyze the frequency spectrum, you may capture the motion and the uh, scene information. So uh, here's the uh, framework of our descriptor. Given a video clip of size m by m, and we have t number of frames, we stack them as a volume here. Then we compute the 3D uh, discrete Fourier transform so that we go to frequency spectrum. Here we do have a 3D filter bank, and for the first filter, uh, we, we apply the first filter on our on the frequency spectrum. Then we take the inverse tra transform to go back to time domain. Here you will have the uh, volume, which is the same size as the input volume. So we uh, we do some averaging in sub volumes, which are going to be the blocks, and we do the same for the other filters. Finally, we concatenate all these uh, vectors, and it's going to be. The descriptor, but since it has high dimensionality, it's around in this case 35,000 dimensions. So we, we apply PCA for reducing dimensionality. Then we can train a, a support vector machine. When we have multiple clips, uh, let's say we have k clips of the video, we again do the same, but this time our descriptor is going to be even longer. Then we still reduce the dimensionality. Then we can learn these behaviors training a support vector machine. So in this slide, you, uh, I'll show how motion can be captured in frequency domain. Let's say we have a 2D, two-dimensional pattern here, which is going to be this one doesn't matter. Yeah, which is going to be uh, f0xy, and it's translating on uh, the image plane with u1 and u2, like u1 in horizontal and u2 in vertical direction. So. If we stack these frames, it will create a space-time volume, which is in terms of x, y, and t. And here you can see it's through fx, y, and this is shifted by u1 and u2. This is the standard 3D DFT uh, equation here for, for, an, uh, for a volume of m and, and t dimensions. And uh, if you look at the uh, 3D DFT of the space-time volume, this is the equation here. So we can just uh, organize the arrange the terms so that we can take split this into two and also we can split the exponential here then we may see that the uh, center part is the 2D DFT formula so using the shift property of Fourier transform we are able to write it as 2D Fourier transform of f 3 xy and here this is the shift term which is corresponding to this shift and then we can um, we can take this out of the sum because it doesn't depend on t, and it's going to be like this. And you can see that the right-hand side is going to be the uh, delta function, the direct delta function. So this is the 3D DFT of the space-time volume, which means that it's going to be non-zero whenever the term inside the parentheses is zero. So this is going to be a plane equation in 3D. Here's the, here are some examples. So this is an object uh, translating. And here, this is the space-time volume here. So you can see the X position is changing over time here. And when we take the 3D DFT, we will see a single plane here. 
And when we have objects with different motion, this is going to be the space-time volume, and we will have two planes in this case. When we have two objects with the same motion, this is going to be the space-time volume. This time we will again have a single plane, but this is not going to be a whole plane. This will, some have, this will have some gaps on it. And when we have, again, same direction but different speed, which means different motion, then this is going to be the volume, and we have two planes. When we have an object which has a changing uh, intensity, you will have this one as the space-time volume, and we'll have two planes, and the separation uh, is uh, related to the oscillation frequency here. And this is a similar case. When we have two objects, we'll have two planes. So uh, our descriptor is computed by applying uh, 3D filters on the frequency spectrum, and uh, different orientations and bandwidths uh, of these, fil uh, these filters with different orientations and bandwidths capture different components. And we don't need interest point or detection or background subtraction. And we can keep the important geometrical information. So here we have two scales of filters, 37 filter in the first scale and 31 filters in the second scale. This is the transfer function. So you can see that here FR is the central uh, frequency and sigma R, sigma theta, and sigma phi are the radial and angular bandwidths of these filters. In this animation you are seeing the filters in two scales. This is the scale two. So it captures all the frequency spectrum. And here you may see all the filters uh, in the 3D uh, uh, frequency spectrum. Why did we keep the, this configuration? Because we did an experiment. So we collected 500 test videos uh, from UCA50 data set. And we computed the cumulative um, energy spectrum before applying any filters. And then after applying the filters, we check the cumulative energy spectrum, and now we see that we keep uh, more than 99% of the total power in the frequency spectrum. Here's an example uh, where, uh, example, example video. Here you can see there's horse riding action. This, uh, this is the sample clip, and these are the filters, and these ones are the outputs of the filters. So you can see that the first filter, this one is capturing the motion of the rider, whereas the, this one is capturing the motion of the legs. And also there are some filters in our filter bank which capture the uh, edge components. Here this is capturing vertical, this is capturing horizontal, and this one is capturing diagonal components. And this is another example here. There are two cars, and the capture of the first car is captured by this filter, and the second one is captured by this filter. And these three filters are the same as the previous ones. They capture vertical, diagonal, and uh, horizontal and diagonal components. So our descriptor can capture both motion and scene information. Here's an example for that. Here we have uh, four uh, sample clips. And these axes show the relation of these clips. For example, the red axis is jumping a park, and this one is jumping a urban. So this is the same action in different scenes. And the green axis shows different actions happening in the same scene. So this one, jumping and passing, happening at park, and jumping and kicking, happening at urban scene. And the blue axis shows the different action in different scenes. Like jumping and passing are happening in different scenes, and jumping and kicking and are happening at different scenes. And uh, we extract computer descriptors uh, for these four test clips. Since this is high dimensionality, you may not be able to see the differences, but maybe you notice there are differences. So we look at the distances of these descriptors, uh, and now we can see that whenever the action and the scene are different, the uh, distance is very high, and also the distance is still high when we have the action or the scene is different, which means it can capture both motion and scene information. Here are, uh, here are the data sets we used in the experiments. So we had KTH, UC50, and Lifton. We also had track with 11 event collection, which has 15 events and 62 concepts. I'll describe it later. These are the experimental settings. We downsampled all clips to 128, 128, and 64 frames. And we extracted three clips per video. And uh, using 68 filters, our dimensionality of feature vector was around 100,000 uh, dimensions and we reduced it to 2,000 by PCA, and we did cross-validation for the experiment. Here, before training any uh, classifier, we first 
wanted to see like how, uh, like how, what's the distance between these descriptors for different uh, videos belonging to different action classes. So here you can see the step descriptor, which is a local descriptor. And each entry in this uh, 50 by 50 dimensional matrix is showing the average, uh, average similarity between the videos belonging to one class versus the other class. So you know, ideally, the diagonals should be high, and the off-diagonals should be low. And uh, we can see that our descriptor has uh, much higher diagonal entries and much lower off-diagonal entries. So it has uh, higher intra-class similarity and lower inter-class similarity. And this is the quantitative result on UCA50. So our descriptor outperformed the others. So Steep had 54% uh, accuracy, and our descriptor had more than 65%. And also, we combined GIST and STIP, and we got even more than 73% classification accuracy. We also tested uh, the uh, performance of GIST 2D, which is capturing only the scene information. And we extracted different numbers of keyframes, and the performance saturated around 40%. Also, we have some other descriptors, such as just color gray and PCA, and they're also low. So this is the confusion table for STIP. And you now this, this confusion table shows action is uh, confused with other, uh, what other action. For example, the diagonals should be high and off diagonals should be low. And uh, so this is for Steve. And for G study, it is pretty low, which is just capturing the scene information. And we, this is the descriptor we present. And this is the combined descriptor by late vision. So we can see the diagonals are getting higher and higher. We also did similar experiment on HMDB51. So for the intra-class and inter-class similarity, we can see, the, see that our script is performing better. And these are the quantitative results. So we, we again performed the best in the state set. And uh, we compared it to step. This is the confusion table for step descriptor. And this is our confusion table for our descriptor. And this is the combined, uh, classified, uh, combined descriptor. So as an additional experiment, uh, we tested our descriptor on track with event collection. It has 15 event categories, such as boarding, train, feeding, animal, and so on. And when we did multi-class uh, classification, we got 37% classification accuracy. Uh, we also have 62 manually annotated uh, action concepts here. So you can see vehicle moving, pers person walking, and so on. So for these ones, uh, we have the detectors. And you can see the precision recall for each of these detectors. There are 62 of them. Then using the histogram of these uh, detectors, detector outputs, we, trained mal uh, we uh, did multi-class classification, and we got 36%. And then uh, combining it, we got 40%, 41%. So just using video, no audio, right? Yes, just video. So person singing, they were just standing still pretty much? Yes, so in that case, it won't. But still, maybe person singing, you know, it may, if she has a you know, specific pose, it may help because it captures the gradient. Uh, this is the result on 88 cases. This is a relatively simple data set. All methods perform similarly well. And this is the confusion table which shows, you know, these ones are kept. Uh, and in summary, uh, we present the scene and motion descriptor, which has these advantages here listed, no interest point detection and no global histogram. And we got the best performance on the, these two challenging data sets. So in the first piece, I uh, described the advantages of holistic descriptors, but also they may have some problems. So in this part, part we, are we are trying to improve the performance. Here, this is the problem. We have, the, we have a sample video here. This is the kicking action of UT interaction data set. So normally, we stick these, and you know, this is our volume. And when we want to compute the holistic descriptor, we go to the first block, and we have the descriptor for this block. Then we go to the second block, we have another descriptor. And then we do have, let's say, k blocks here. This is going to be 64 blocks. Uh, and this is our long holistic descriptor, which is concatenation of all of these. But as you can see, these, uh, here we just blindly combine all the descriptor blocks. But some of the blocks may not be uh, required. They may be redundant, or they may be confusing for the classifier. And uh, so if we remove them, we may have a better uh, computation and uh, memory specifications. So our goal is to uh, select the optimal set of blocks so that the performance is still good and the, dimension, the, the dimensionality of the feature vector is less. 
so that we can extract the partures, uh, features partially and we get better performance. Here, uh, like let's say we have an, uh, descriptors in our training set. X, X is the X, X I is the descriptor for the sample I. So I is from one to n, and we do have uh, n corresponding labels. When we have two classes, it's going to be either negative or positive class. So the labels may be minus one or one. So for every sample I, this is the structure of our holistic descriptor. Now X I is the uh, is the combination of all K blocks descriptors of K blocks here, X I1 to X I K. Normally we do have the SPM classification score here. Uh, this is the weight vector and this is the bias. But we can divide it into per block SPM responses so that the SI is going to be the sum of the K blocks, uh, the scores of K blocks here. So for every I and J, which means for every sample and for every block in the data set, we do have four conditions like the score of that particular block for that sample may be negative, and the uh, label may be negative also. In this case, the classifier was right, so it, is, it has some good discriminativity. Also, if the label was positive and if the score was positive, it is good. But in the other cases, the classifier was wrong. So then we define the discriminativity measure for block as a summation like this, so I can explain it in the next slide. Uh, so this one... So we want to have a k-dimensional vector, which is telling the discriminativity for every block for that classifier. So here, this is the uh, animations explaining it. Here we have the sample one, and we have k uh, k scores, which are the scores of individual descriptors. And we do have uh, we do have sample two similarly, and we have n samples in our training set. So this these are shown by the color map here, the values. So we do have n labels for these descriptors. Then we can just multiply them, and then we can sum them up. Like, like we do the column sum. Then that's going to give us the discriminativity for every block. So it's going to be a k-dimensional vector. So it was for the, uh, for the binary SPM. Like right, we have two classes. But if we have multiple classes, let's say we have c classes. Let's say we have c is 3. Then we will have. Uh, three models, which are going to be the SVM for class one versus class two, class two versus class three, and class one versus class three, so which is given by the equation. And in this case, rather than having one uh, column vector for the discriminativity, we will have n columns for each of these models. And this, the, rather than being a vector, it will be a matrix of size k blocks by n models. So normally the average discriminativity we can define it as just a uh, row sum. So that so this is going to be the discriminativity for block one, block two, and so on. But uh, this is the the trivial solution could be that we pick the high values of this one and remove the low values. But there is even a better way for this. I'll explain in the following slides. We first uh, try to do this trivial solution. So we have 1536 blocks for the G3D on KTH dataset. So we keep removing the confusing blocks here. And as we keep removing them, the performance is increasing up to a point where it starts rapidly uh, dropping. So we'd like to pick a point around here, which is going to be the optimal point. And for the other two data sets, we did the same. So we saw that the performance is uh, increasing, also the dimensionality is uh, decreasing, which is good. So for this purpose, we defined two things. Uh, like another uh, term here, intra-class discriminativity. So normally we are able to remove some of the uh, rows here, uh, which are uh, corresponding to confusing blocks. But let's say one of the entry is very important for that particular classifier. So we would like to uh, still uh, include it. That's why uh, we look at the column sum here, and it's going to tell us the intra per class discriminativity. So. We have this measure here. So this is the sum before removing any of the blocks. So this is going to be an all ones vector. So we do sum all, all the way. And then we remove some of them. And then we sum this again. So these two uh, vectors should be you know, close to each other. And then we also have the global discriminativity, which is the 2D sum of these vectors. And we still want it to be high. And we want to. Uh, we want this vector to be sparse. So this is the way. We uh, use, uh, solve this minimization problem 
that way we get uh, we find which uh, blocks are the optimal set of blocks here uh, this is the ut interaction data set which has six action classes kicking handshaking hugging pushing punching and pointing and they have 20 videos per each class which makes 120 videos so these are the these are all the blocks shown in the x axis for this data set and the red ones, uh, the uh, y, y axis is showing the discriminativity for every block. So we pick only the, we select only the red red ones, and we remove the green blocks. So this is going to correspond correspond to a 3D mask uh, for this data set. And these are the. So after masking those videos, you can see that the unimportant regions in the video are removed, and the regions of the video uh, where the, the actions are happening or the people are present are still uh, used for descriptive computation. So we had uh, multiple benchmark data sets for testing our performance. The first one was the KTH. Then we did have the UT interaction data sets. These two data sets have six action classes. We have the UCF sports actions data set, which are YouTube videos. And we have uh, 10 classes here. Um, we do have UCF 101 data set, which has 101 actions. But here we have the subset, which is just related to inter human interactions. And we have five action classes here. So we also tested uh, our performance on UCF 50 and UCF 101, which are for human action, uh, which are the data sets for human actions. And also we have the HMDB 51, which is a very complicated data set. So this is the confusion table for UT interaction data set. You can see that the punching and pushing are, uh, have some confusion, which makes sense because they are similar actions. And also, you know, here kicking and punching have some confusion. And these are the results. So the first three are the hog 3D descriptor that we extracted uh, global in a holistic manner. So we extracted hog 3D on time domain, frequency domain, and also we had the fused descriptor. So the performance was 80 percent, 74 and 82 percent, and it, it, uh, we improved it to 86, 78, and 89 percent after applying our method. So then we were able to get the state of the art. And uh, on UCF Sports, we picked uh, these uh, red blocks, we selected these ones, and removed the green ones. And this is the confusion table. We uh, tested it on hog uh, 3D descriptor, and we got a 4 percent improvement. Also, we improved the performance of Action Bank to 95%, and this is the state of the art. Also, for UCF 101 interactions, we selected only these red red blocks here, and this is the confusion table here. So the uh, you can see that the uh, parade is confused with band marching, and so on. So for this uh, subset of five actions, we got a 74% classification accuracy. This is the uh, confusion table for 101 actions on this data set. And these are some ex results. So you can see that we are able to improve the performance of all 3D to, from these values to the, these three values here. And also, uh, we are able to beat uh, the step. Uh, so uh, step, in this case, improving from 36% to 48%. Uh, this is the result on UCA 50. So it improved. Th this result was presented in the previous chapter, uh, section of the thesis. So it was 65 percent, and now it is 68.9 percent after improving it. And also, here you can see we improved G3D on HMD from 23 percent to 24.5, and the Action Bank is also improved. This is the result on KTH. So we are able to improve both descriptors. And this is a summary of all the results. The uh, black uh, columns show the, original, the performance of original descriptors. And after improving, we get the red blocks here. And you can see for consistently for all data sets, we got some improvement. So in summary, we selected the optimal set of blocks. And we are able to reduce dimensionality maybe to you know, less than 15% of the original descriptor length. And uh, the experiments show that we can get a performance improvement removing the confusing blocks. In the first two uh, pieces of the work, uh, we focused on in actions of individuals, 
but also there are crowd scenes where there are hundreds of people. And in this piece, we are uh, focusing, uh, identifying specific crowd behaviors. So first I'll show what these behaviors are, then I will uh, present the theoretical concept behind the method, and then I'll show the proposed framework uh, by some examples. Finally, uh, you'll see the experimental results. So uh, here we are interested in five specific crowd behaviors. Normally there may be many number of different crowd behaviors, but these are some common and specific behaviors. The first one is the bottleneck. In this one, people uh, from many points in the scene go through a narrow passage. And the second uh, behavior is the when um, people emerge from a point in the scene and they separate in many directions. So this is called departure. And uh, when the people uh, or the vehicles are moving in similar speed uh, and in similar direction, we call these behaviors lanes. And when there is a curved or circular motion, we call these behaviors arc or rings. And when there is opposing flow so that the, the movement of pedestrians is prohibited, we call this uh, blocking. So the challenge is that these videos have a lot of diversity, as you've seen, and different resolution and so on. And there are uh, a lot of objects in the scene, so uh, our goal is to identify the uh, behavior of crowd rather than identifying each individual behavior. So this is the conventional uh, framework for behavior analysis. You first take objects, then you can track them, then you can learn, learn these behaviors. But these approaches fail for high-density scenes due to you know, severe occlusion and so on. And, and these are computationally expensive because you need to uh, detect and track each individual. And in order to do, learn the behaviors, you need to manually isolate the behaviors so that you have the positive set and negative set and so on. So we treat the optical flow uh, in a scene as a dynamical system here. And this is an example sequence. This one's showing the optical flow with this color map. The, uh, the color is showing the direction of the motion, and the intensity is showing the magnitude. And using Euler's method, which is especially the numerical integration method, we, we advect some particles in the scene. And uh, when we advect these particles, we compute these particle trajectories here. So normally for every pixel, we do have uh, one particle. But here I show only a, a subsample of them. Then we keep track of these particles in two maps. Like x flow maps keep keeping the x position, and y flow map is keeping the uh, y positions of these particles. So we have two differential equations in our system. Here w is the position x, y. And dx over dt and dy by dt are the particle velocities, u and v, here. So the constant solutions for this type of system are called fixed points, which are given by this equation. And uh, by doing uh, Taylor's theorem, uh, here ux and uh, uy are the partial derivatives here. We are able to uh, write this one, uxy, as this one. And you can see that uh, we can define two new, a new coordinate system here around the fixed points, which is z1 is x minus x star, and z2 is y minus y star. And these are the derivatives with respect to time. Then we can write this one as this equation, because this, u, this one is 0 here, and this is z1, and this is z2. Similarly, for dz2 by dt, we can write the equation like this. So if we define z1 and z2 as a vector here, we can write these two equations in matrix form here. It's going to be the derivatives of z, and here this is the z vector here. And the j is going to be the uh, Jacobian matrix here. So uh, looking at the Jacobi matrix and its eigenvalues, we are able to relate the behaviors uh, in the scene. Uh, so we have five different configurations here. Like when there's a sync fixed point, we see that the eigenvalues are negative and real. So this is similar to a bottleneck behavior. When there's a source fixed point, the eigenvalues are positive and real, and this is similar to a departure. When there's a line of fixed points, at least one eigenvalue is uh, zero, and this is corresponding to a lane. For the settled fixed point, we do have you know, eigenvalues with different signs, and this happens when there's blocking. And when there's a center fixed point, we see that eigenvalues are complex conjugates. And this is uh, similar to an arc ring. Here is our proposed framework. Uh, given an input video, we first compute optical flow, u and v. And then we, in the first task, we find the important regions in the scene. We advect the particles, and these particles accumulate in some regions so that we can cluster the angles of these trajectories, and then we are able to define the uh, regions of interest. 
And in the second task, we do have the, uh, we compute the Jacobian uh, of optical flow in those regions. So, and we look at the IGM values so that we can uh, label the behaviors. Uh, here's an example seen uh, showing the framework. We have a train uh, station sequence here. And this is the optical flow. And these are the particle trajectories for this scene. And here you can see the density map, which is showing the density of particles in each point. So you can see as time passes, the particles accumulate in some regions in the sea. And here, this is another sequence. We do have a traffic scene, and some cars are turning here, and some are going straight. And uh, these are the particle trajectories uh, for this scene. And you can see this is the density map. So this is the density map for the first scene. We call this we find this accumulation point as the uh, cluster of local peaks. Uh, then these are the trajectories which are uh, on that point. So when we look at the angles of trajectories, this is the histogram. And for the other scene, we do have two points. Like for the first one, this is the histogram, and for the other one, this is the histogram. And when we see there is some high variance, uh, we check the point if there is a bottleneck or not. And when there is low variance we check if there's going to be a lane or arc over there. Then we do have the average optical flow computed for the scene using this, co this color map shows the flow. We look at the J uh, Jacobi matrix and its eigenvalues, and we have uh, color codes here. So when, uh, you know, for example, the eigenvalues are negative and real, this is going to be red, and, and so on. And when there's no motion, it's going to be black. So for the first scene, this is the uh, map we see. And for the Second scene, these are the maps we see. You can see the, uh, this one is mainly red, and this one is somehow blue and green, and this one is cyan, magenta, and white. So then we test if you know how many of them are red, and he, here we can see if this is you know combination of white, cyan, magenta, or is a blue. That way we can uh, label the behavior. This one is blocking, sorry, is bottleneck, and this one is going to be a lane, and this is, going to, this is going to be a lane, and it's going to be an arc. In order to detect departure, we just reverse the scene. So this is the same scene, but in reverse time. And these are the particle trajectories and the density map, so that as people you know, go uh, with, the, with the flow, the particles accumulate in these two regions here, which are the gates. And then uh, these are the accumulation points, and we look at the particle trajectories and their angles on those points. So since we can we see there is high uh, uh, you know, there is high variance, we check those points if there is going to be a departure or not. Then we do have the same uh, eigenvalue map again with this color code, and um, we can see that for the first one, the, uh, it's composed of mostly yellow and this one is green and so on. So when we check the ra this te ratio test, we can see this one is the uh, departure and this one is a false positive, so we remove it. Uh, for detecting blocking, uh, like this is the example scene, like there is opposing motion here, and this is the optical flow. It's pretty noisy, and these are the particle trajectories for this scene. And as you can see, the density is increasing in the center part. Then we look at the accumulation point here, and we see there is opposing flow of uh, angles of trajectories. Then we can label uh, we can set, uh, label this point as a, a candidate for blocking. So in the rest of the video, we look if the, there's some vibration and if the you know movement is prohibited. So this is the optical flow and the average optical flow. Then we can see that the map around this region is the green, which satisfies this condition, and then we label it as a blocking behavior. We performed experiments on uh, uh, videos uh, uh, like which were available on YouTube, Get the Images, BBC Motion Gallery, and Todd QD. And we had more than 60 videos uh, of uh, people and vehicles. So we manually annotated the ground truth such that we uh, annotated the positions of block, bottleneck, departure, and blockings, which is just the point where this you know, bottleneck is ending. And for the lanes and arcs, we manually uh, annotated the paths of these things. And uh, in order to evaluate, we required that the detected point for bottleneck departure and blocking should be close to the annotated point. And also, for lanes and arcs, we required that uh, uh, overlap should be high uh, to the 
with the uh, uh, annotated uh, pad. Here you can see some, I'll show some example sequences and these uh, symbols are showing different behaviors. So bottleneck, fountainhead, and so on. Right, this is, these are some example scenes. So here you can see it's like a train station. And it first shows the video, the scene, then it shows the identified behavior, and it also shows the ground. Here there is one a bottleneck and two font departures, and we are able to detect these. And this is a traffic scene, and this is a dance scene here. Here people are uh, forming lanes here, and this is an arc here. So here, this is the entrance of a highway. Here, there's an escalator. There is a bottleneck and the departures. And here, there are lanes detected. This is ground truth. And uh, this is the de detected behavior. And this is detected behavior for the scene and so on. And here, there's a bottleneck. So these were the identified behaviors for these scenes. And these were the uh, ground truth annotations. So these are the quantitative results. So the red columns show the number of detected behaviors for each of the uh, events and each of the behaviors. And the red ones showing the number of misbehaviors. And green is the, are the false positives, uh, false detections. So you can see the blues are very high. And these are the uh, rock girls for uh, four of these uh, behaviors. We didn't include blocking because we had just three videos for that. And this is showing the false positives versus detection rate. So in summary, uh, like we combine the low-level lo lo motion feature, which is you know, which are the eigenvalues of Jacobi matrix, with the high-level information, which are which can be obtained by particle trajectories and, that, that, and the density. And this made it perform well in uh, crowd scenes without the need of training, detection, or tracking. <coughs> But the problem is that this was an offline method, so we need to have all the scene, uh, the video of all the scene before processing it, and it needs some coherent flow. So if the, there's a change in the flow, then it may be a problem. So these are the publications uh, uh, to, in, I did do, uh, during my PhD here, and uh, here are some future directions. Like for example, for selecting the optimal set of blocks in the second piece. We just did experiments and using like fixed number of blocks, as in this case, like 64 blocks and so on. But we could also test the, the blocks in different uh, scales. For example, maybe one of the blocks here is not is confusing at this scale, but if you divide it into smaller ones, it may be important. Or in vice versa, like if they say some block here is not discriminative enough, but if you combine it and get a you know, uh, create a larger block, it may be helpful. So. Uh, one can analyze what's the effect of this and you know how to select these blocks. And we analyzed the crowd behaviors. We identified them, but we didn't uh, study the transition between the crowd behaviors. Here, for example, there was like a blocking, and then suddenly a lane and the bottleneck appears here. And here, uh, there is the bike. There are the bikers, and this is a lane, and suddenly an accident happens, and all the bike. Uh, all the pe uh, racers stop, so this is going to be a con this, this is a congestion area here. So these type of behaviors can be studied. Also, the crowd behaviors may be uh, learned using some descriptors, but uh, for that you need we need to have more data. So we have limited data now. Another problem could be that we analyze the behaviors of individuals and the crowds, but there is also group behavior analysis. For example, for this musical event. Uh, we could study, uh, like, you know, grouping these different people. For example, the people, people playing the violin, people playing the bass, or, you know, flute or piano. So this could be done. So these are the references uh, for this presentation. And thank you for your attention.